Coming up on DTNS, Google makes its quantum supremacy claim official. Apple Pay hits a milestone. And why McDonald's is becoming an AI company. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 23rd, 2019. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were talking about all kinds of fun stuff regarding pets and their attitudes and habits and moving. And uh, if you want to get that expanded conversation, by golly, it's easy. Yeah, just go sign up on the good day internet level at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Facebook CEO, perhaps you've heard of him, Mark Zuckerberg, told the U.S. House Financial Services Committee that the Libra cryptocurrency, quote, will extend America's financial leadership as well as our democratic values and oversight around the world, end quote. He also claimed that China is preparing similar ideas. He also said that Libra is not a sovereign currency, won't launch anywhere until U.S. regulators approve it, and is in the hands of the Libra Association now, not Facebook. Mm. It also looks like data. That's just thing I wanted to throw out there for Star Trek fans. <laughs> Notice that today. Anyway, hey, Samsung update. Oh, wrong one. Sorry. Snapchat added 7 million daily active users in quarter three to reach 210 million. That is up 13% year over year. Snap revenue rose 50% year over year to 446 million, losing four cents a share. Both numbers better than expected, by the way. Snapchat also added 5 million users outside of the uh, North American area. Uh, total time spent watching grew 40% year over year in the discovery tab. More than 100 discover channels or discovery channels. So over 10 million viewers per month in quarter three. You don't use Snapchat, do you? Not anymore. It's the discover tab. There's no why. Oh, there's no discovery tab? No. Nope. Oh, I want to yeah. see Shark Week on the discovery tab. <laughs> I think discovery does have some shows on the discovery. <laughs> oh, they probably do. <laughs> Samsung updated the software for its Galaxy S10 and Note 10 phones to fix that problem that led to any fingerprint unlocking a phone. If you were using a certain type of screen protector when you registered your fingerprint in the first place and then left it on the phone, Samsung is pushing notifications for the update to phones that have registered any kind of biometric data. Uh, the Bank of China and Alipay both pulled their fingerprint authorized functions from their apps on some Samsung devices because of this. If you're paying attention to how Huawei is doing, uh, given its tumultuous year, the company shipped 200 million smartphones so far in 2019, which beat its previous record. The company's Mate X is now set for release in China on November 15th for a whopping equivalent of $2,000. $400. And Microsoft posted its Q1 2020 earnings, uh, fiscal year, hence the 2020, with revenue of $33.1 billion, net income of $10.7 billion. That's revenue up 14%, net income up 21%. Office and cloud uh, led the way, provided most of that rise because Surface product revenue dipped 4%. Uh, no new products in this quarter. All the new products they've announced are coming or came off of the Q1 books. And uh, gaming revenue dropped 7%, also because just not a lot of new stuff in that gaming department for Microsoft. Yeah, we're in between things there on the gaming yeah. side. Yep. All right, let's talk a little more about The Quantum of Supremacy, the new born James Bond mashup movie. <laughs> I can't wait for it. I'll be there day one. Um, actually, Google published a paper in the journal Nature claiming the company's 54-qubit sycamore quantum computer has achieved quantum supremacy a term I am still not totally coming to terms with. Anyway, <laughs> it can perform a calculation, in this case a technique for determining random numbers, in 200 seconds. That would take the world's most powerful classic computer, like normal computers, uh, 10,000 years to perform. Uh, this is the paper inadvertently published on NASA's website a month ago. However, IBM researchers have proposed a method in which a classical computer could achieve that, cla uh, that calculation in a practical amount of time, a few days. IBM's method would require using the hard drive space in addition to RAM and other optimizations to perform that in 2.5 days to be exact, rather than <laughs> that much more lengthy 10,000 years. Oh, yeah, that seems more reasonable. Just a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. I mean, rather Tom, than 10,000 years. Tom made a really good point on the morning show today. <laughs> came on and talked about this a bit on the segment. But you made a, real good, a really good argument for... That's still kind of practical if it's only three days. That's not that yeah. bad. It, it's something you could do. You could yeah. do. So the idea of supremacy, the reason they use the term supremacy is not about quantum computers being better than classical computers. It's that quantum computers right now are clunky. 
and they can't do anything better than a regular computer. So the supremacy is, when do we get to the point where there's one thing that quantum computers can do that classical computers can't? And can't is defined as generally impractical. Taking 10,000 years to solve an equation may be great, you know, for the Stuart Brand folks who, you know, build 10,000 year clocks, but for most of us, that's too long to wait. So that was a fair comparison to say, okay, quantum computers can do this one thing. That one thing ain't totally useful. Maybe, you know, there's lots of ways to generate random numbers, but for demonstration purposes, we found a thing that quantum computers can do better. But as we told you yesterday, IBM says, well, we think we can do this in two and a half days. Now, IBM hasn't done it. They've just proposed a method to do it that makes sense. So now somebody's going to have to like carry that out on a classical computer and show that it works the way IBM says it would work. And then that would undermine Google's claim to quantum supremacy. And we'd be back to waiting for that milestone to be reached. That milestone to be reached is just kind of a marker that says quantum computers have advanced to X point. It doesn't really mean that they're useful or practical or going to start breaking all your passwords or anything like that. Moving on to mobile payments, eMarketer reports that Apple Pay has passed Starbucks mobile payment as the most popular mobile payment app in the United States, the first time a generic mobile payment app has led this category. eMarketer estimates that 30.3 million Apple Pay users in 2019 uh, are, are exist now compared to Starbucks's 25.2 million followed by Google pay with 12.1 million and then Samsung pay with 10.8 million. Apple pay is expected to be available in 70% of us retailers by the end of 2019 us users are estimated to spend 1,545 per year per person using proximity mobile payments this year, which is up 24% over last year. That is quite a jump. Yeah, this is another one of those milestones, right? Where we're yeah. looking at something and going, oh, we wondered if people were really going to use this, if Apple Pay was going to be the thing people would use. And it turns out, yes, they're going to use it and they're using Apple Pay more than other stuff. Can I buy coffee at Starbucks with Apple Pay now? Was that That's all? a great question. I, that is a good question. I think you I can. I think you can. Because I think they have the NFC card readers for yeah. other things. That would make yeah. sense, right? Like, that's how I feel this is going to go. So all of these big uh, these big numbers, all, Apple's more than double the, the next guy, but, well, not more than double. I guess 25.2 is closer to that. But anyway, all these other ones, Google Play, Samsung's Pay, it'd be cool if every place just, if one became prominent enough, let's say 10 million or more people using it, It'd just be cool to be able to just support it. They're just readers. Like, yeah. I don't have a problem well, with that. And, and that's the thing, right? CVS had it where it would work, and then they stopped at work because they wanted to do their own thing, and then that thing never caught on, so they went back to letting Apple Pay work. And when Apple Pay works, generally Google Pay and Samsung Pay also work because they work all the same way. Although I have I have complained about this on the show before. The natural food store that is near me, um, which is wonderful, and I frequent it often, Every so often, I kind of, you know, it's early in the morning. Maybe I'm walking the dog. I don't have my wallet on me. They only accept Samsung Pay. They don't accept Apple Pay. And but it has that, gotten me into trouble more than once. They're not using the NFC system. Samsung Pay can use Magnetic Stripe, too, because it emulates the Magnetic Stripe. Uh, That's why. Oh, that, okay. But, again, that said, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it has... Uh, uh, it has become a conundrum uh, w once or twice for me, you know, in, in various places. But for the most part, yeah, Apple Pay uh, has improved my life because, I, you know, I've got an iPhone with me at all times. Well, China, we know you're laughing at us because you use WeChat for everything. That's fine. Uh, let's check in with Russia. Russia's Yandex, most well-known for its search engine, announced Wednesday it'll begin testing driverless cars in the U.S. next summer. Yandex cars will offer driverless taxi service during the North American International Auto Show in Detroit from June 6th to the 21st. And then they'll keep those cars over in the United States for further testing. Yandex is creating its cars in collaboration with Hyundai. Uh, there's a couple of areas in Russia, Skolkovo and Innopolis, that have working test zones right now where people can use Yandex driverless taxis. Uh, Yandex also has a license to test driverless cars in Israel and is considering an IPO for Yandex Taxi, its joint venture with Uber uh, that would also use driverless cars uh, and maybe some of Uber's technology there. So uh, just, just kind of thought this was interesting because it points out that while you probably see Waymo and Uber in the headlines for driverless cars, especially in the United States, uh, there are a lot of companies testing this in a lot of parts of the world. I'm super curious about, I know this is not 
not even that important because we're talking about driverless is sort of the key feature here. I want to know what these look like. Like I want to see a Russian driverless car up close and I want to. <laughs> it I want looks to like a it. Hyundai. Yeah, I was going to say, have you seen a Hyundai? Yeah, then, I guess it's then like. you uh, kind of know what it looks like. I guess, you know, when I was in high school. It's not like a Soviet driverless car. Well, I think that's see, where that's, your head that is. That is where my head is. You're not wrong. I'll admit it. I have Soviet ideas in my head. I drove a Yugo for a while, which is a Yugoslavia car, but I wow. drove it for a while in high school. Really? It was a piece of crap. The steering wheel came off during a date. It was the worst thing ever. Um, I'm not saying these are going to be bad like that. I just have it in my head that they're boxy and mean looking. No, they look like a Hyundai. They, in yeah, fact, yeah, no, do a search they, for Yandex driverless car at Google Images, and you'll see tons of pictures. They're perfectly nice cars. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. what, they say what Yandex I, Taxi in Cyrillic on them. That's the only weird thing. What I think is interesting about this is it's it's Yandex is, I mean, it's it's you might not use it. You know, it depends on where you are in the world. But that is a very big search engine used by millions and millions of people. And the fact that the company is like, okay, well, we're going to expand into driverless tech, um, the way that a lot of other companies um, from other parts of the world have done the same, just goes to show you how much people want to be at the forefront of this new thing. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we're, we're talking about driverless technology, driverless technology, you know, there are, you know, very small uh, tests that are going on in the US, for example. But they're small, and and we're all still kind of you know scratching our heads, being like, okay, how's this gonna work? Is it safe? Is it gonna be okay? And a company like Yandex, a huge company, which you you know you don't necessarily associate with any car technology, well, you know there they are with everybody else trying to get yes. in here. You guys are right. They look like Hyundai Elantra hatchbacks. Yep. Uh, the the Chrome 78 browser launched for Mac, Windows, Linux, Android, and iOS, offering an image gallery, themes, and options for suggested shortcuts, curated shortcuts, or, if you're like me, no shortcuts at all. That's not true. I like shortcuts. A uh, forced dark mode setting will enable dark mode on all websites using color inversion theory to keep them readable. Google's password checkup extension will soon be integrated, although that's not in there now, prompting you to change a password if necessary. Click to call lets you click on a phone number uh, on your desktop and sends it to an Android phone. Chrome 78 is testing DNS over HTTPS as well. That and, last uh, one is what got him in trouble with the advertisers in the UK and yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I've, uh, I think I'm running it now, and I think it's a little peppier, or maybe I just feel like it is. I uh, yeah, I thought this was interesting given our conversation yesterday about Firefox 70, uh, where all of the new features that we focus on with Firefox 70 are security and privacy. Firefox is out there like, we're making this more secure, we're making this more private, we're letting you see these kind of trackers. Not surprisingly, that's not the big feature of Chrome. Although there are a couple, like you said, the Google Password word, uh, checkup extension coming in. Uh, it's not like Google doesn't want to make things more private and secure, but uh, if Privacy and security are top of mind. Firefox definitely compares better between these two versions coming out within a couple of days of each other. I got to say, it is so interesting to me. And this is, you know, coming from somebody who was like, uh, I don't like the, you know, the dark mode thing. I don't want that. You know, it's just like, it, you know, it makes everything look like, you know, hacker news or whatever. I've actually, I've really come around it's more readable. And the fact that it's sort of like, we now have a forced dark mode for websites. Even if the websites don't actually want you to have dark mode, we'll do it for you. It is, uh, th that is that is a feature that like, I would have chuckled about not that long ago, but now I'm like, I really like it. Yeah. And uh, hat tip to Scott, you're the one who texted me the other day about seeing the story saying that the OLED screens were you know, maybe saving some battery life because of dark mode. Yeah, and they seem seems to actually be accurate. Um, I know I'm getting longer battery life in my 10 than I used to, but I thought it was just me having, again, some sort of observation bias or something. Mm -hmm. it, it seemed better. And I've also come to like dark mode on desktop, on tablet, on phone. And I was so not into this when it was first happening. And I, I'm, I don't know what Kool-Aid I drank, but I'm totally into dark mode. And I'm glad Google's doing this. So, 100%. yeah. Uh, if you're uh, watching uh, the video, I'm going to go dark mode now. There you go. There, <laughs> there it is. Nice. You good feel their video. Yeah, looking good. <laughs> well, Sarah, what's, a, what's up with Google Stadia? Oh, 
well, Tom, glad you asked. Google announced that it cannot fulfill all pre-orders for its Google Stadia streaming service in time for its November 19th launch date. Stadia's Founders Edition customers are the only customers that are being promised delivery. A Google representative told Ars Technica that Founders Edition shipping starts the 19th and will be fulfilled in order received, with Premier Edition shipments shipping in order after Founders. Google told The Verge that it expects all Founders and Premier Edition pre-orders to be shipped within the first two weeks of launch. Uh, but Ars Technica says if you try to order premium right now, uh, it gives you a shipping date sometime in December. So they're not rolling all these out at once, Scott. Nope. I'm I'm not super annoyed because I'm not into the first round of this. I kind of need to see it settle in on other platforms, PC in particular, browsers, all that stuff needs to happen before I get really on board. Um, but it is a little weird. You're talking about a controller and a dongle that's basically a Chromecast, and that's it. And I'm not saying that everything's easy to make all the time, but it seems like Google should have the wherewithal to get that done. And I don't think there, it's because too many people bought them. There, I think part well, of, I was going to say part of it is they, they're charging like the same price for both editions, and that's weird. Although you get the Founders Edition first. if you Right. So they should have realized that more people would want the Founders Edition because it ships first, right? Uh, that makes sense to me. There are a few reasons why this could happen. One is they just underestimated the interest. They, they made a certain amount of controllers and more people were interested in signing up than they thought. Uh, that, that can happen to any company, right? Because you you make a guess. That and is hard. Guess that wrong. one's hard to swallow, though. Like well, Google why is it Stadia, hard to like you, well, when because you, because when like you the build, press release based on build, Google Stadia was a very big deal. When you build hardware, though, you want to have a precise amount of hardware ordered. You don't want to over order. It's very important. And there's no like mm. you know accepted way of saying like, well, we made a big press release and it's going to be this many people, right? You that mm. could be a lot of people and still even more people. And it doesn't take that many more people. I to suppose. Cause I guess. I guess. I just you know when I see that it's Google, you think, well, if you're going to be bullish, be bullish. Yeah. Well, if you're Google, you can't make mistakes. Is almost what you're saying, right? You're I, so big. I, yeah. Why would you right. ever make a mistake? Kind of, so, actually, there's there's value in saying that because I think that they need to be. At, this this needs to be as smooth as possible for them to compete in the way that they're planning on, and to take on Microsoft and XCloud, and to take on PlayStation and any other gaming platform that sees Stadia as the hot new next thing. I, I just think they have to be careful about this stuff. So I'm a little bugged on that end. But in terms of like supply and demand, I totally get it. Normally, the way this works is they know how many they're going to make exactly. And then when they sell out, they sell out and you stop selling them and you say they'll be back when they're back. In this case, it doesn't sound like they did that. It sounds like they're doing a lot of estimating. And I don't know why that is, but that probably well, has something to do with it. I didn't even get to the other reasons, right? Uh, it's, 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 and I think this is, this is emblematic of the situation. Like Google can't do anything right except be perfect. Right. Uh, cause it could be that they, they didn't get the order right. It could be that there was an unforeseen pro problem in the supply chain that slowed down the orders. Uh, and so maybe they had some padding, but, but they didn't get the yield out of the factories that they thought they could get, which Google not being great, you know, not being a big producer of hardware and not previously producing controllers could be part of it. Uh, and it could be that they want to have fewer people in here because they want to limit what can go wrong when a lot of people start using Stadia at once. And the, the, the more you can control the influx of people, the better chance you have of making sure those servers work well and those servers have to work well. Yeah. I mean, just look at how we're, we're talking about Google with the shipments part of it. This thing cannot go down. It can't have latency problems or it, people are going to rip it apart. Yeah, I'm nervous about that. We'll see. You think you're nervous. Imagine we're <laughs> <laughs> Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Article in the New York Times today called, Would You Like Fries With That? McDonald's already knows the answer. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Because <laughs> McDonald's has spent hundreds of millions of dollars acquiring artificial intelligence companies. Uh, we've talked about Dynamic Yield, which does AI for drive through orders. Uh, we've talked about Apprente, a uh, voice-activated platform for taking orders. So it recognizes your voice. You don't have to talk to a person. It can handle more orders that way by doing voice recognition. McDonald's has a tech hub in Silicon Valley called McD Tech Labs. Uh, that's not unusual. Domino's has their own uh, R&D innovation center in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Engineers and data science all working on lots of things like voice recognition solutions. Uh, one of the things they're talking about in this article are smart 
drive-through boards that take into account things like the time of day, the weather, popularity of certain menu items, the length of the wait, and change the menu based on that. So for instance, simple, very simple version of this. On a hot day, I might show you a soda. On a cold day, I might show you coffee. Transactions now also have recommendations suggesting what else to order, kind of like Amazon. Like, oh, I see you ordered a Big Mac. Would you also like fries with that? Right? That kind of thing, but on a grand AI scale. Uh, there's even the idea of recognizing license plate numbers with your opt-in, saying, is it okay if we keep using your license plate numbers so that when you pull up to the menu, the things you like to order are up there and you can see what options are available. Personally, I would love that. Um, it is where it's being tested uh, leading to larger orders. So it's working. McDonald's is selling more stuff to people. I kind of want to go test it. Does anyone else want to just go over there and just go, you <laughs> think I want fries, but I'm going to say I don't want any fries. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, you know, I mean, listen, McDonald's is, um, I, I don't go through the McDonald's drive through all that often, but it does happen. And I'm, I'm with Tom. If you know what I got last time, it's probably what I want to get this time because, you know, I'm a creature of habit. So those sorts of things actually I find uh, helpful when it comes to, you know, what, what I'm going to see on the board. Um, what, you know, things like uh, time of day, temperature, what might be offered to me as a beverage, you know, is it hot, is it cold, you know, would, we're going to try to help you. That's, that doesn't really bother me. The whole kind of license plate number identifying customers, which is opt-in, again, doesn't mean, doesn't mean, you know, anybody has to freak out. You have to say, but, you know, I'm interested in this. That is, even if you are interested in it, and even if that does actually make your ordering process better uh, going forward, that does give me pause. But then again, why wouldn't McDonald's want to do this? Yeah, all companies I, do this. Totally, totally, and and I think it's important to. to New York Times has a really snotty tone uh, to this article, like people that eat McDonald's, am I right? Mm -hmm. uh, and just kind of take it pot shots at the healthiness of it. But I right. think that's more interesting to think about this story from the idea of a restaurant that is selling you food, whether you like the food, hate the food, whatever, it doesn't matter. This is interesting, because a lot of restaurants when you drive up. The menus are organized to try to get you to order certain things, and that frustrates the crap out of me because I never want to order sodas. So it never makes sense for me to get their combo. And then I have to hunt around to find the other stuff. If it could recognize my license plate and go, okay, this guy, don't even don't even show him the combos. It's fine. He, he just orders a la carte. Uh, that, I would love that. But you're right. This is going to cause people to start thinking about restaurants as tech companies as privacy violators because they're collecting data on you. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this story, Daniel Henry, the chain's chief information officer says, you just grow to expect that in other parts of your life. Why should it be different when you're ordering at McDonald's? We don't think food should be any different than what you buy on Amazon. Oh, Mr. Henry, um, which is, <laughs> he has a point. He does, he, he, he actually does have a point. At the same time, I think that that is a very convenient way for McDonald's to be like, well, Amazon does it. Mm. We, we can do it. Also, right? no, read the room, Daniel Henry. Uh, what's happening right now is people are getting upset at companies for doing the things you're saying we expect in other parts of our life. Granted, uh, it's totally hypocritical on the part of the human race to be like, ah, I'm not going to read the terms of service. I want things for free and just suddenly wake up one day and go, you did what with my information? But that's what's happening and so if you want to be a tech company in that sense, I think that's smart. I think it's a great way to make sure that your restaurant survives, but I wouldn't go around saying, and we're not gonna do anything different. I think you need to, to actually say, and we're going to respect your privacy as they are with the opt-in, right? On the driver's license, uh, we're gonna let you you know, handle your data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, that would be truly forward thinking. Yeah, that's some super, super sketchy language uh, that he's using there, and I don't like it at all, but I'm kind of with Tom, I sort of want this. Like I kind of want smarter destinations for lots of things, not just yeah, food. yeah, and food makes the most sense. Like this seems like the good next step for this sort of thing. I think that tech is interesting, but they have got to get out ahead, like you said, read the room and get out ahead of this stuff. Not just in language and PR, but like showing us what their plans are very ex explicitly regarding security, uh, or else you're just you're just asking for it. They're going to get just 
killed on this if they don't do that. So Well, and one of the things of the New York Times article that we didn't really touch on was that apparently the fast food industry is 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 lagging. You know, it's 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 not growing, it's shrinking. So of course a company like McDonald's, you know, arguably the the, the at the forefront of fast food in general, would be like, okay, well, we're going to get somebody through the drive through already. How do we get them to, you know, like buy a couple more things, you know, based on what they know? It's, it's the exact same thing as, as, you know, ad tracking. It, it really is. And I think it's very smart on the, on, on, uh, on the company's sake. I just, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't know how many people will be outraged about this, will care about this or will love it. Well, it depends on how they do it, right? And, and the answer is it could be both. Uh, Domino's is trying to say, we're a tech company that also sells food in restaurants. We're an online company. Uh, that's the mentality that a lot of these companies are starting to have. And we're just talking about drive through and ordering here. There's also understanding what things are being ordered, what kinds of flavors are emerging, uh, and knowing before the audience or before your customers do what kinds of food they're going to want to have. Uh, what should we add to the menu? When should the McRib come back? All of that stuff is a way to get people to come into the restaurant more often because it's not like people aren't eating food. Uh, it's just that they aren't necessarily eating your kind of food, and you you want to use this technology as a way to, to make sure you're super serving the audience. That can mean better restaurant experiences. It can also mean privacy violations or, you know, leading to unhealthy behavior, trying to encourage unhealthy behaviors, et cetera. But those are all the kinds of controversies you can expect to see erupt around this stuff, especially if you read this New York Times article. They're, you can tell they're just salivating at the idea of having stories to write about uh, where they can expose the privacy violations of future restaurants. Well, privacy violation stories are very welcome in our subreddit, as are other stories that you care about. <laughs> you can submit your, <laughs> in fact, they are. You can submit stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Thanks to everybody who submits. You help us make our shows every day. We're also on Facebook. Join our group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. You want your voice on our show? Email us, and then we might read your email in the mailbag. Indeed. Uh, this one comes from Paul, although Johannes and a few others wrote in about our conversation the other day about why not, why don't Google and Amazon review voice apps that are updated for security reasons? You know, the, why don't they act more like an app store the way that we know app stores to go? Uh, Paul says, well, it would be really hard to do that. Voice apps work more like a web app than a native phone app. That is to say, most of the code in a voice app lives on a server, and then the voice hardware acts like a web browser, just relaying voice commands to that server. So you could get an app approved and then change your server code to respond differently without ever having to go through the approval process. There are some changes that would require getting re-approved, but most changes can be done without this. So to implement what you suggest, Google and Amazon would have to sample requests that look for bad behaviors, sort of like how an antivirus works. It's probable, but it would be really expensive. On yes. another note, uh, as for reasons not to switch to Firefox, this is, you know, Paul, Paul just, he had lots of ideas. The developer tools aren't as good. They've gotten much better recently, but Chrome still kills it there. I'd be willing to hear arguments against this, though. Convince me to use Firefox, please. Uh, just keep using it. The more you use it, the easier it gets. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, if you have to develop on Chrome, then you can use it for your development. But just surf on Firefox. Uh on to the other stuff, Johan and a few others wrote in pointing out, and I knew this, I just forgot it because our own Daily Tech headline skill uh, sits on our server. So, of course, I can go in and change that anytime I want, and Amazon doesn't know. So it would have to be a different situation. It's not like Amazon can't afford to have the space to copy this over and host it uh, and scan it, but maybe they just don't want to go through the expense that that takes to monitor. So that's a very good point. Uh, thank you, everybody who pointed that, that out to us. And thank you, Paul, for writing in. Absolutely. A uh, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Tony Glass, Rushan Brantley, and Adam Carr. And Ooh. thank you, Scott Johnson. Yay! You know what that means on Wednesdays. It means everything went fine if I get thanked. Uh, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having me as always. If people are like, man, what is that other weird stuff does that guy do? I have a great place to go. It's called frogpants.com. You'll find all the shows, all the art, all the projects, everything I got going on right there at frogpants.com. 
And if you're just trying to yap at me online, you can find me on Twitter at Scott Johnson. We have new patron rewards, and I'm so excited to give them out in just about a week on November 1st. So get in there and take a look and sign up. If you're listening to the show, uh, you can get a commercial free just, just by signing up to be a patron at any level. And we've got other rewards at multiple levels. Everybody who's at the $2 level or above on November 1st gets a PDF copy of our cookbook uh, recipes from ourselves, from our listeners. Uh, it's all there in a PDF of the DTNS Good Day Internet Cookbook. Sign up right now, patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you have feedback for us, we would love to hear it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>